All right, everybody, ready to go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Loop and Learn's T1D Speaker Series. And this is a kind of unique event for us. We started to talk about it as an open mic night, but we really don't know how many people will be out there. And we're just going to see if we can share a whole bunch of information since the majority of loopers in the US are using Omnipod. And the big news is that Omnipod came out with their, their five version, which is a closed loop system. And we have oh so many questions. So uh, we have an opportunity to speak to the lead nurse coordinator for one of the study locations and several, and I'm not sure if I have more than I actually know about yet on this call, who have been in the trials. So they are familiar with looping. So they've lived what we live and they've also lived through the trials. And it's gonna be just really interesting to hear what they say, what their impressions are, what they liked, what they didn't like, and uh, you know, ask your questions. And we have full house of admins on board. So put all your questions in chat. If you're on YouTube, please put them in YouTube and we'll bring them over to Zoom. And here we go. Our, our little disclaimer that the Loop app is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm. And we're gonna be talking about Loop but also a commercial system. So if you remember that you take full responsibility for your own decisions and you consult with your healthcare professionals regarding your own diabetes self-management. Don't take it from us, please. Um, or you can, but don't. Um, um, you take full responsibility for building and running the system and do so at your own risk. Please remember that the Loop app is not FDA approved for therapy. If you don't know that by now, we'll tell you again next time. Um, upcoming events, uh, really interesting things are coming up. Um, trying to make you guys interested and never bored. Dr. Laura Nally is coming back for a um, second visit with us. She loves us. She is really enthusiastic and asked when she could come back. Uh, it'll be this Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. She is a pediatric endocrinologist. She is a T1D. She is a looper. Uh, she has a specialty in looping and pregnancy and looping and exercise. So her topic is looping and exercise. She's enthusiastic about coming to talk to us. We're just really honored. She is from Yale University and that is this Sunday. And then the following Sunday, this will be an interesting event with Eric Verhoff from Seagrove Partners. They're a market research firm specializing in the diabetes market as well as I think the uh, cardiology markets. And um, he originally said he wanted to talk about the commercial systems that are out and the commercial CGM. I said, we know all that. We, we have that information. Um, please understand, we're, we have a lot of knowledge. We just want to know more stuff. The stuff that you can't tell us is what we want to know. Um, and he has some research that he's done getting perspectives from uh, PWDs on technology versus what HCP healthcare professionals think about the technology and the absolute disconnect between the two. I thought that would be a lot more interesting than hearing about Medtronic. So uh, we'll see how that goes on uh, a week from Sunday. Um, so today is Omnipod 5 versus Loop or Loop versus Omnipod 5. I wanted to show you because this is actually a good news ticker for today, the Insulate stock, Insulate makes Omnipod. Um, their stock has been all over today as, it, as its low as 212, it went up to 260, it closed at 255, it 10% gain today in a very uncertain market. I don't know what that means and I have no stock advice for you, but I thought you might like to see what this is because it's somehow significant and interesting. So that's, that's all I've got on that. And what I'd like to do is uh, turn this over to um, Carrie first. Um, Carrie, is it Burgett or Burgett? Burgett, Burgett. Carrie Burgett. Yeah, wrong. Forget. Hi, you. Uh, she lives in Denver. She is a uh, nurse coordinator. She was on the um, Insula Omnipod Five trial um, at her location, and I was going to ask if you could just give us a little bit of an overview. If you need to share a screen, or if you have any slides you want to show, I can do that as well. Um, 
give us a little sense of what the trial was, what you did for the trial, how many people were there, um, what you all learned, and um, how it went. Yeah, great. Um, so again, I'm Carrie Forget, and I'm a pediatric nurse from the Barbara Davis Center in Denver, Colorado. And I've been at the Barbara Davis Center for about 10 years now, and I've been managing our kind of diabetes technology research team for the last six years. And we do dozens of trials every year using various um, new emerging diabetes technologies. Um, so we've done lots and lots of trials on AID systems. And the most recent one being the Omnipod 5, which has actually been going on for about two years now. Um, so I've, we've had lots of experience using the system and working with our kids and their families who um, are in the trial. At our center, we have 20 youth age six to 17 or so that are in the main pivotal trial. And then we have another 12 kids that are in the um, preschool trial. So ages two to five, that that's currently ongoing as well. Um, and then, but trial wide, there was over 200 participants and ranging um, in the main pivotal trial ages six to um, over 70 years old. I think the inclusion criteria went up to 80 years old. So a large range of age participants. Um, a disclaimer for me is that I am a pediatric nurse and I really have experience solely with pediatrics, um, maybe up to age 25, but um, don't work with adults very often. So just wanted to get that out there. Um, the trial consisted first of a two week period where participants continued with their usual therapy in a Dexcom G6 just to gather some baseline data. We had participants in the trial that either were coming from multiple daily injections that were coming from standard pump therapy and that were coming from um, other automated insulin delivery systems. So really a wide spectrum of prior therapies coming into the trial. Um, additionally, other inclusion criteria was had to have an A1C under 10%. So um, that was one ex uh, inclusion in type one diabetes for at least um, six months to be eligible. Um, otherwise it was pretty, well, it was pretty wide open to try and make sure we had a wide range of participants that reflected, you know, the, the kind of spectrum of people that have diabetes and experiences that they have and the levels of control that, that people with diabetes have coming into using Omnipod 5. Um, so they did two weeks of their standard therapy, as I mentioned, and then we transitioned them to the Omnipod 5 system, which in the study was referred to as Horizon, but it's basically the same. Um, and it was really great. We did three months at, uh, at uh, three months was the main trial to gather the data to submit to the FDA for safety and um, efficacy. And, and then after that three months, they had the option of continuing on in, in continuing to use the device in an extended use phase until commercialization. And as you all know, commercialization and FDA approval took a very, very long time. So um, people have been in the extension phase for about 18 months now. And um, which has been cool because now we've been had exposure and have um, worked with families have used the system for two years to manage their diabetes. So lots of real life experience and long term experience. Um, should I start trying to answer some of these questions or no, just uh, you do your thing and talk. Okay. About what you did. Um, yeah, I don't have any slides or anything. But um, what I can tell you is, you know, basically what the Omnipod system is, I can give you a brief overview of how it works and, and everything. So um, it consists of the pod that you are all familiar with. However, the pod has not the algorithm actually embedded into each pod. So it's a new pod. It looks identical, but it has the software algorithm in the pod, which is really cool because it allows the Dexcom to actually communicate directly to the pod. And then the pod uses that Dexcom information to automate the insulin delivery. Um, it's referred to as an adaptive basal rate is how is kind of the terminology that's used. And basically what that means is the Dexcom receives that and sends the information to the pod. And then the pod determines a micro bolus of insulin delivery every five minutes. And this is based on the user's total daily insulin. That's kind of the, the basis for the insulin automation. Um, 
and then it takes the, the Dexcom information and then determines based on where it projects the glucose to go in the next 60 minutes, determines small micro dolus, boluses to deliver to try and keep the glucose at the target. The other unique aspect of the Omnipod 5 is that it has adjustable glucose targets, which is not currently available in any other um, commercially available automated insulin delivery system. This will be the first one. The user can program their target anywhere from 110 to 150 um, in 10 milligram per deciliter increments. And you can program up to eight different segments throughout the day. Um, and so that has, that's a really cool feature that allows a little more personalization um, in using the system. Um, what else? And then it's also going to be the first system that can be operated by a smartphone. So there'll be an Omnipod 5 app. When it first comes out, it will only be available on the Samsung S10. That'll be the only phone that you can download the Omnipod 5 app on. Um, but if you don't want to use your phone or you don't have the Samsung S10, you can also have receive a controller. They're going to call it a controller now instead of a PDM. And um, this controller will have the Omnipod 5 app on it. So um, yeah, so that's kind of a brief overview of the system. So it's automated basal, and then just the users still give boluses for their, for their mealtime doses using traditional insulin to carb ratios and correction factors. Um, however, the bolus calculator is also unique because it incorporates not just the glucose value, but also the glucose trend in the bolus calculation. So that's also a unique feature where, you know, um, normally in a traditional pump bolus calculator, the correction would solely be calculated based on the glucose value itself. But this one, if the trend is going up or down, it may increase or decrease the recommended bolus dose based on that. So my understanding is that happens in manual mode too, right? Yes. So it doesn't have to have the automated mode on in order for it to be using the trend arrows in the glucose yeah. calculator. That's correct. So that you can access that smart bolus calculator um, in manual mode or automated mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the bolusing for meals is really important. Um, without meal bolusing, you're unlikely to, um, you know, attain targets for glucose control. That'd be really difficult. I, in pediatrics, um, we have unintentional trials for that, <laughs> that go on where kids don't bolus and we see how it goes, but I've, I haven't seen anything better than maybe 50 percent. Um, but that's with teenagers. Maybe if you ate really low carb, you, you know, potentially could, but, um, bolusing is recommended and, and really important to success and optimal glucose control on the system. Um, and like we've seen with all automated insulin delivery systems to date, the overnight control is really where we see the most impact. Um, and especially for, for youth, um, just so many comments, you know, as I work with 32 families at our center right now, like it's almost every single one of them just raving about how happy they are to sleep all night and not be woken up to high and low glucose levels um, throughout the night. So that's been really, really rewarding and awesome to hear um, that kind of impact on quality of life and just general health to be able to sleep, which is awesome. So we, we actually totally understand that because mm -hmm. the DIY loopers, that's the first thing you notice. Yeah, it, I'm sure the DIY it, loopers have the exact same experience. Like the, it's amazing how well these algorithms can work overnight and the daytime, it still is beneficial, but I think the biggest impact really, at least with Omnipod 5 and any other commercial system that I've seen, and I've worked with all the commercial systems and done all the trials with all the commercial systems, um, you, you see it over and over again that the nighttime improvement is really remarkable. A question about that. I saw someone on um, Twitter post that his son is, has been 90 all through the night. He finds it amazing. And so I asked about his... Um, his target. And he said, no, it's the standard 110 to 150. I don't know if that means he has the whole range. Um, so I asked Trang Lai how that happens if the target isn't mm -hmm. um, set for lower. And she said, that's part of, the, that's how this works. Can you explain that? Yeah. You know, that's a really great question. And honestly, the way that I explain the targets to, to the people with diabetes I work with as I say, this doesn't, this doesn't mean that your blood sugar is going to be 110 all the time. 
this is the brains. This is the brains behind how the algorithm is working. And so the algorithm is calculating the doses intending to aim for 110, but that doesn't mean you're gonna be at 110 all the time. Um, but if it's aiming for 110, that's more aggressive than aiming for 120 or 130 or 140 or 150. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's the challenge of diabetes. It'd be awesome if we could program a target and then the algorithm would just keep you there. That would be incredible. Um, I have not seen that. And that's where, in my opinion, in all the systems that I've seen and worked with, the target is, it's really just a strategy, a way that you can, and I like that it's adjustable. And we see that used a lot in pediatrics where we have higher targets overnight. Um, Cause if someone is running low overnight, we'll increase the target and then they won't run low anymore, but they may not be all the way up at 150. If we set it at 150, they may end up running at 110 or 120 overnight, which is incredibly beneficial because we don't want them to run at 70 overnight, you know? So I think of it more as a strategy, as a way to optimize and change the algorithm function um, and less so about it being like, a, oh, this is the number that your blood sugar is going to be at. And the last thing I'll say about that, that if you look at the trials for the commercial systems, Control IQ, 670G, and um, Omnipod 5, you see very similar outcomes overall, like global outcomes of time and range. Pediatrics tend to achieve high 60s, 68, 69, 70 in some cases, and adults tend to have higher, maybe 70, mid 70s percent time and range. And this is the average across all participants. And that's the same whether you have control IQ that's targeting a range of 112 to 160, or whether you have Omnipod 5 where you can program 110 to 150, or whether you have 670 that can only be 120. So I think that also just reinforces the concept that it's just the way that the algorithm works. It's not necessarily going to say that that's the number your blood sugar will be at. Okay, but I'm going to come back to that because I still am scratching my head. If it's 110 to 150, I would expect it might go below 110, it might go above 150. But how is it hanging at 90 all night? How is yeah. it doing that? Yeah, and I would be interested to hear from any, if there's any adults that use the system, if they experience that. But I have seen that quite a bit with kids um, running in the 90s overnight on closed loop systems, which is why we increase the target so that it will not maybe run too low, but it's still not at the target. Like I said, if I have a kid programmed at 130, they may not necessarily be running at 130. I think that this kind of gets to some of the challenges of total daily insulin based algorithms, because when the algorithm is based on total daily insulin, it's really more, it doesn't necessarily understand the differences between times of day. So it kind of approaches all 24 hours as the same. It doesn't necessarily understand that like for a kid, their insulin sensitivity really increases between like midnight and, you know, 3 a.m., for example. Um, but the algorithm doesn't necessarily, can't really understand that per se, um, because it's, it's basing it on TDI and it's basing it on current and projected glucose values. And so it doesn't know that necessarily there's a difference between midnight to three and, you know, maybe eight to midnight where they tend to run a lot higher. So because their sensitivity is a lot, um, a lot less or they're more resistant during that time. So that's where I think the adjustable targets is helpful because it gives you a way to adjust to that within the algorithm parameters that can help you optimize those outcomes. Cause running at 90 overnight is, I would say, okay, depending on the person's comfort level, but it's, it's not low. Um, so I feel less concerned about whether it's matching the target and I'm more concerned about just their overall control and finding ways to optimize their outcomes within the, you know, constraints of the algorithm that we're working with. Yeah, I think our, our question is, we want, we want that. We want 80 to 90 through the night. And what we hear 110 is the bottom of your target. How do we adjust when our loop settings are usually 90 to 100 or 85 to 95? So how, how, do, how, 
how do we make, that's probably one of the things that stops a lot of us from saying, I could use this system because I can't sit my range. Right. Yeah. I mean, all I could say to that is I would set it at 110 and you may run, maybe you'll run around 110, maybe you'll run 90 to 110. Um, I think that, I think that the thing is, is that with, because the algorithm setting is not a perfect science, um, and I don't have a lot of experience with loops, so I don't know how well you can tell your system what target you want to be at and how well it does that all the time. Because in my experience with diabetes, that's not really a much of a thing, at least not with kids, um, the consistency of that. Um, I, I'm more focused on the global overall control um, and stability of that control. So yeah, I mean, I think I've seen whether it's 90 or whether you're running at 110 to me, but again, in pediatrics, I would, I would be pretty happy with, with that either way. So I may not be. That, the message, right? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> in your location um, with the kids you had, um, did anybody hate this and, and quit early? Nobody hated it. We had, we had one participant that um, opted to exit after the three month study and opted not to continue in the extension phase. And her reason for that was, it was a teenage girl, 17. She, she opted not to continue because she, she didn't like the pod itself. So it had very little to do with the algorithm um, as is usually the case with teenagers aren't as concerned about the algorithm per se overall, but um, she had never used a pod before and she just preferred to go back to a tube pump because that was what she felt more comfortable on. So it was about the size and things, nothing. Um, I, I've really, I can't really think of much negativity, to be honest. It's actually been an overwhelmingly positive experience um, at our site with all 32 participants ages. We have a kid as young as two and the oldest is like 19 or 20. We have one that did end up because the trial went on for two years. So went off to college, but um, yeah, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Um, the phone control is, has been really popular, um, especially for kids where it's like, it, it doesn't look like a medical device. They're more willing to bolus because it doesn't draw as much attention um, that, you know, they can hide their pod really easily. Um, yeah. And, and are, are, were you in touch with the other study centers with kids? So did you know, did you have similar experience to everything they had as well? Yeah, I believe so. Like I never heard any negative. I mean, there probably was, pe there probably were people that didn't like the algorithm. I mean, I can tell you that there were some families that I worked with that had a harder time adjusting and then eventually did really start liking it. But that learning curve um, was harder. And I would say that was more common for those who were in very tight control coming into the trial. Um, it's a hard thing to give up some of that control when you're used to basically being your own automated system and adjusting your basils and sugar surfing or, you know, some of these other like strategies, um, you know, that people with diabetes come up with to gain excellent control. Um, but ultimately, even with those families who really struggled with that, um, they ultimately decided to stay because they, they let go and some of them even actually had slightly worse control. Some of them who had very tight control, maybe A1Cs and the low, um, low sixes, which for pediatrics is kind of unheard of, um, you know, with really tight control, even giving up some of that control to not have to do the micromanaging that they were doing um, in the past and deciding they're okay with a six and a half A1C and no lows and not micro dosing and all these things. So there's definitely some give and take. I mean, I, I do think that with commercial AID systems, um, I, I do think that there's, there's gonna be lots of people who could still do better um, and with on their own. It's the burden benefit ratio that I think everyone kind of, you know, 
navigates through at the beginning to figure out what that balance is for them and what they're willing to take or leave or what they want to get rid of and maybe be okay with slightly less time in range or a slightly higher A1C. Got it. I, I'm going to ask one more question then I'm going to um, ask the people who were in the trial. So I know there's Veronica and there's um, Rebecca and I don't know if there's anybody else that were, was on the trial. Um, you can unmute and then um, uh, Cassidy and Tina, if you wanted to start lobbing some questions, but I'm just curious, were you at all in touch with any of the other study centers that dealt with adults? And did you get any feedback? If you did, or did you get feedback about their results and their... Um, yeah, I mean, our own center had an adult um, trial. Um, that was the primary investigator was Dr. Shaw, Dr. Brill Shaw there um, at the Barbara Davis Center. And we do know a few adults from our center. I don't know. Do you have any? Anecdotally, I know one of them loved the system. She was just, she couldn't say anything bad about it, but I don't know how many people stayed in it versus decided not to continue with the mm -hmm. continued access mm -hmm. phase. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know any specifics um, about that. I do know that 95% of the participants trial wide. So that includes ages six to 80. Um, in the over 200 participants, there were 17 sites in the US, 95% um, of them opted to continue into the extended use phase. So that's a very high uh, number because it was a, I mean, the main trial data was done, like the data had been sent to the FDA. So, cause you might say, well, they probably felt bad quitting on the study, but the study was over. I mean, this was solely to give them access to continued use of the device if they desired it. And 95% of them did. So, um, that I think speaks to the high satisfaction that, that we saw. And one other thing I did wanna mention um, about the TDI is that it updates every three days. So the pod itself tracks the total daily insulin. And then as the, the, that total daily insulin changes over time, the pod will update the total daily insulin with every change. Um, and there is no way, you don't enter the TDI. The TDI is solely calculated by actual insulin delivery. So unlike control IQ where you program the total daily insulin, with this one, it's it's solely by the amount of insulin that you receive. Um, Cause I did I did see a, a question there about, about that. And, and it's, so it updates and allows it to adapt across time. So if your insulin needs are going up, which we see a lot in pediatrics, then with your next pod change, it's likely gonna be better because it's, been trying to give you more as your blood sugars are running higher. And then with that next pod change, it has the new total daily insulin. Is there any, any time where you get into trouble because you're needing lessons? You, you binged on the weekend, Super Bowl, and then the next day you say, I've got to go on a diet um, where people are crashing because they don't need that much insulin. Yeah. I, what I would say is that these, al the algorithm is very, very good at preventing low blood sugars. And so with, it's much better at adapting to less insulin needs than more. Um, so I, we really didn't see that very much at all um, because it's pretty darn good at preventing lows. Got it. Okay, I'm gonna kick it over to either Cass or, or Tina to um, grab some questions. So how difficult was it to get on the settings just right? And did it really matter if they were or not? Yeah, are these questions you want me to answer, Joanne? Yep, absolutely. Oh, okay. Tina has um, a, an 11 year old yeah. who was looping. Uh, yeah, you know what? It really wasn't, it really wasn't much. I mean, for the majority of the kids, whether they're coming from multiple daily injections, standard pump, or um, an, another automated insulin delivery system, we mostly just transferred their settings over. Um, we did a little bit of assessment because the one thing that is important with, um, Omnipod five is on the very, so with the very first pod, you can turn on automated mode. And you might be wondering how that's possible because it doesn't have any total daily insulin history to use, but it estimates your total daily insulin based on the programmed basal profile. It's the only time that the system uses or even considers your basal profile. Um, and so, and it uses that to estimate what your total daily insulin would be. And then to, as like a jumping off point for the automation. 
And then after you do your first pod change, it completely ignores your basal rates and goes entirely to the total daily insulin that you've been receiving. Um, so the, the one tip that I have for, for the Omnipod 5 is you really do want to make sure that the basal program that you program is about like give or take about 50% of your total daily insulin requirements, because that will help it get the best estimate of your total daily insulin starting off. If your um, if, if your basal program is low, like maybe only represents 20% of your insulin delivery overall or 30%, it's likely going to take a a little bit longer for it to um, adapt to your true insulin needs and you may run higher for a little bit longer. Um, but other than that, I think usually the settings that you're using in like a, any kind of manual therapy um, would work. Now, if you're somebody who is more like sugar surfing or micro dosing and isn't using as much the traditional like basal program and, you know, carb ratio correction factor, all of that, then you may, you may honestly benefit from kind of reassessing starting settings based on total daily insulin. Um, so that you get off to a smoother start, um, with the Omnipod, because the thing is, is changing the basal rates after that first pod is not going to have any impact on the automated insulin delivery it has no influence whatsoever. Um, and then the other thing is that for most people, they need stronger carb ratios with an automated system. You guys probably see that with loop two. Um, I don't know, but with most, with Omnipod five specifically, the way the algorithm works, it will, if it, if it predicts that the amount of insulin you have is enough to bring you to your target, whether it's 110, 120, whatever it is, it will suspend. And that was a common question we got in the very beginning, a common, like what's going on? <laughs> like question, because you can see these suspensions occurring, even if you're 130, 140, but, and they usually don't last very long, but it's just how the algorithm works. It's trying to float you there and get you there. So it's not suspending solely based on predicting hypoglycemia, like some other algorithms do. It's suspending based on you reaching that target. So all that to say, a lot of people are suspended leading into mealtime because usually you've kind of landed back at the target or even below the target. And so then you have very little insulin on board and then you just have these stark rises with, with eating. So we also find that adjusting the insulin to carb ratios or assessing that kind of early on really helps with um, optimizing glucose outcomes with it. I want to jump in here and ask Veronica to introduce herself. She is a parent of a T1D child who was in the study. So to, just un unmute yourself and put your camera on just so everyone can see you and say hello. And, and then we'll go to Rebecca and just introduce yourselves. What was your experience? And then we'll start tossing out the questions and you know, any of you can just let us know. And again, if there's anybody else who was in the trial that I didn't pick up on the uh, participants, you know, let us know as well. So Veronica, say hey. Hi, uh, so yeah, my name is Veronica. My daughter Charlotte started on the um, Horizon trial when she was six or six and a half. We are at the stamp, we were at the Stanford or are at the Stanford site because we're still part of the like, extend the trial bit. Um, and we are one of those people who I think you guys were talking about that we've decided to trade the tighter control with loop to the benefits of Horizon, one, uh, mostly because of the freedom that it's given our daughter. She started when she was six, she's eight now. Um, there's been a lot of growth that has occurred during that time for her of you know, being more independent, wanting to go to camp um, and just doing a lot of things um, on her own without constant parental supervision or adult supervision. And we've decided that we rather trade a slightly higher A1C for um, when the safety, or just for not having to figure out red loops, Riley links not working, all those things that are really hard for her to manage on her own, um, you know, being away from us. And um, the user interface is just so easy to use. You know, we, we, we can send her to camp all day and just tell her what she's gonna be eating. She's gotten pretty good at math pretty quickly. 
Um, and she can, you know, figure out what she's having for snack, what she's having for lunch, dose herself. It's very, very easy to use, even for us to be able to teach other caregivers, like a teenage camp counselor who's never known anything about diabetes. It's very easy to teach. So we have given up some of that um, my, a little bit tighter control from loop just because of the freedom and, and it's allowed her to grow and gain confidence in taking care for, of herself. And, and I mean, we, we've would given, you mind elaborating on the A1C difference? Yeah, I think A1C going into the trial was maybe 6.5 and now we're 6.9, 7.1. We're total control freaks. Uh, so, you know, we do intervene a lot. We always get it from Dr. Buckingham. Who's the, the head here. Don't, you don't need to give so many boluses by giving more boluses. It's not like you're really increasing or, you know, decreasing her A1C, let it be. So you don't get so many lows. So we always get in a little bit of trouble for that. So, yeah, so we're trading, you know, a 6.5 to, uh, I think the highest it's been a 7.1, which again, to, we still feel very comfortable again for a pediatric, um, with that, just for the independence, we were trying to, um, you know, mitigate her development as a child with her diabetes. And we feel that that trade-off has been, has been really good for her. Thank you so much. That's um, great. So, so let's, let's jump over to uh, Rebecca. Say, Hey, I see you posting it here. Um, yes. so yeah, there we go. Hi. Hey guys, so I'm Rebecca. My daughter's name is Cameron. She's participated in the Omnipod trial for two years. Started at 13, she's now 15. Um, she's had diabetes since she was four, so this is not anything new to us. She was already on Omnipod before the trial, already on Dexcom before the trial, so for us it was like an easy switch. Um, she was looping for about three months um, before the trial, which for me was like a daunting task setting that up, um, dealing with like, just like Veronica said, the red loops. Um, I mean, I've had to like pick her up from sleepovers in the middle of the night because she couldn't figure out how to get the pod to connect, um, with the Riley link. So it was a lot, it was just a lot to deal with. Um, although I did see a big increase of, um, time and range while looping. So we were happy with that, but it was a lot of like technical issues that we were not expecting to deal with. So kind of like Veronica said, moving to Omnipod, it was just so easy. It just felt like any, you know, anyone, you can hand this to anyone and they could figure it out. It's just pushing buttons. Um, so my 15 year old liked that she didn't like having to carry around the controller, I guess that they're calling it now, because when she was looping, it was on her iPhone. So for her, yes, she had to keep up with a Riley link, which I know is different now. Um, but it was like adding another device. Um, so for us, like the pros of it, um, sleeping so much better, um, we went from a lot of disruptive sleep, you know, as a teenager growing you know, 13 and 15 years old, you're growing a lot. Your insulin um, needs are changing constantly. Um, so I think the system did a really good job of, you know, handling like puberty and periods and she's a um, high school soccer player. So a lot of activity with this child, like five days a week, three hour practices sometimes. Um, her A1C has improved. She had the best A1C that she's ever had in the 10 years since being diagnosed. So for us, that was huge. Like we were really, really happy with that. Um, another thing I will say, we've dealt with leaking pods on Omnipod. It just happens. Sometimes you give too much of a bolus and it can't, it doesn't, it, it can't handle it. So I feel like we've had less leaking pods with this trial. Um, yes, they still happen, but they do seem to happen less often. And also I've noticed the accuracy of the Dexcom is so much better. Um, we used to deal with like loss of signal and um, just it going in and out. Uh, it just didn't, I, I was never happy with it, Dexcom and she had been on Dexcom for like five years. We had had G4 all, you know, it's been a while. We dealt with all the issues. Um, so I'll just say the pods and the Dexcom in this system I don't know why, but they just seem to work so much better. Um, so we've been really, really happy with that. Um, it's just been for us a great experience. Um, do, you and feel, do 
you feel comfortable with just mentioning what her A1C has been on this trial? Yeah, so uh, honestly, I don't know if I could tell you off the top of my head. I'm not like, you know, she's had diabetes a long time. She usually stays within the mid sevens. I want to say when she started after three months of looping, she was maybe like a 7.5. The best A1C she had while looping was 6.8. And right now, as of like two months ago, she was 7.1. So we're happy with that, with just everything that's the chain. I mean, it's just a lot when you're a teenager, it's really hard to keep up with those insulin needs. It's constantly changing. Um, but the team, I forgot to mention, but we're in Atlanta. Um, so we were out of, um, a practice in Atlanta and they were just amazing. They were there for us at every step of the way. If we needed help, um, with figuring out, Hey, what needs to be changed? They would make a slight change and we would see that reflected in her blood sugars, um, and her, her trends. So it's been a good experience. So jump in on that also time and range. Did you, do you track that with the Omnipod 5? So I do, but I look at, so we love sugar meat and I still use the sugar meat app. Um, so I haven't looked at it consistently. Um, I do think that some days, yes, some days are wonderful. Are there other days that are a mess though? Yes, but that's diabetes. Um, and she's a teenager. So I still have to be like, Hey, did you bolus for that? Um, sometimes. So, and that's another thing. The system has done a great job of kind of compensating when she does, you know, maybe wait 10 minutes after she started eating, even though she knows, you know, I should have already bolus for that, but you know, you're a human and that's just life. <laughs> A real quick question. What insulin were you using in, in the pod? She's using Novolog. Okay. Yeah. Um, was, was everyone required to use a, a regular, not a, a fast acting insulin? Um, I just know for us, we, we were using our own insulin. So I don't know what other trials did, but we um, provided our insulin and just used whatever, whatever we were using at the time. I can answer that, that it was a requirement to use rapid acting insulin, either Humalog or Novolog. So that you couldn't use Fiasp um, or any of the other ultra okay. rapids in the trial. And Emily, were you involved? You, did you have a child in the trial as well? No, um, I just work with Carrie and I also loop. Okay. So okay. I, I worked on the early, early versions of this trial when it was like the algorithm was on a iPad that we had to keep in the backpacks with the kids, like early, early, early trials. So yeah. that's my experience with this, but I didn't work much with the pivotal trial that Carrie worked on. So you're, yeah. you're a perfect person to ask, are you going to jump onto the Omnipod 5? Or are you <laughs> Ooh, oh, tricky. Yeah, yeah. On the spot. yeah um, <laughs> I, I'm going to stay on loop for now, but that is, I, I don't think it would have a problem going on Omnipod 5. This is just, I wouldn't have to deal with going through getting a new system and doing all that kind of stuff. But um I don't feel like it would be hard to go on to Omnipod 5. But you're not like instantly tempted. Are you, would you worry about it? Because we all, we have that. Right, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think I'd worry about it. Um, I haven't had a ton of the technical difficulties. I have an orange link and that has been great. Like I don't have that disconnect or the yellow, the red loop very often. If that were the case, I think I would hop on Omnipod five pretty quickly. Um, I was on control IQ before this and I had a A1C in the fives. I don't think I'd have a problem getting an A1C in the fives again with Omnipod five. So I really don't feel like, how how would you do that? What do you mean? How would you get in the fives on a, a system that doesn't let you set different targets? I mean, I didn't even use sleep mode all day on control IQ and I was a five, seven. So I don't eat super high carbs, but I don't like limit myself. I'm gluten-free and dairy-free. So I don't eat things like pasta or pizza. Um, I, I don't know. It was really not that hard for me to get that. I know that's horrible to say, but it was, um, I was surprised to see how good that A1C was and how easy it was for me on control IQ. I will say that my settings changed a lot. So I had to dramatically increase my sensitivity factor and my carb ratio 
to feel like I wasn't, like Carrie was talking about earlier, we come in with these automated insulin delivery systems with their suspending beforehand. If you come into that, um, you don't have as much insulin on board as you would need for a meal. So you just have to hit it with more insulin. Um, so, I mean, when I was on control IQ, I targeted 112.5 to 160, 160. I mean, and I was still is. able to do it. I was not in sleep mode all day. I was in sleep mode overnight. And I think I would wake up between 100 and 120 every morning. So depending on what my insulin sensitivity is doing, if I was on my period, you know, all that kind of fun stuff, what would happen? I, I, I mean, I pre bolus most of the time and I'm fairly active and I, I bolus for carbs. <laughs> like, it was fairly easy. So I feel like I can switch between the other two. The other thing I do pretty often is go back on shots, but I'm just sort of <laughs> not your typical person with type one. I, I do. Cause I just, I, but it works for her. I do. Yeah. So <laughs> you, you, you lost half of our admins when you said no pizza, um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's only because I can't. <laughs> okay. I can't like I have it. And that is one thing. I don't remember. It does Omnipod five have an extended bolus feature. No, you can't, it does, but only in manual mode. Okay. So you cannot extend the bolus. And there was a question about that in the chat. Um, yeah, you know, I am very from the, from the, um, nurse side and just, you know, I don't have type type one myself, but from all the families that I work with and all the different systems, I, I am not sure how much of a difference extended boluses really make in commercial AID systems, to be honest. I've, I've seen it with and without, and actually earlier versions of the Omnipod system did have extended boluses, as Emily alluded to. This algorithm has been under investigation for about six years. So it has been, we have gone Thrill. through a lot of trials and we have done all of them. And there was a period where they tested out extended boluses with the algorithm compared to not having an extended bolus and really found that the extended bolus made, made no difference. Um, and I think the reason for that is because the algorithm is essentially doing the same thing as an extended bolus. So you give the bolus and then if you're running higher after the meal, the algorithm is gonna ramp up the adaptive basal to try and adjust to that over time or, or you know across after that meal occurs. And so it's, it's a similar, it's a similar concept to an extended bolus already. And same thing, if you have too much insulin from that initial bolus, then it's going to, it's going to decrease or even suspend the adaptive basal. So all I can say, um, it's not that I don't think people probably can very successfully use extended boluses from, but from more of a global perspective, um, at looking at the data from lots of people, overall, the extended bolus didn't seem necessary, which is why I think they didn't end up going with it in the commercial product, um, leaving it out. I'm going to uh, pitch this over to Cass, Cass Robinson. Uh, she's a T1D since the age of two. She's in nursing school. She's a looper. Um, she's very, very active. And um, she's going to throw some questions at you. Then we'll get back to Tina and Kenny Fox, who's Gosh, is she nine by now? Eight or nine year old daughter Tessa is T1D and looping. And um, so they're going to start volleying you questions. And any of y'all who've been on the loop, please feel free to jump in and answer. So, Cass, say hey. Can I first say, like, Veronica, is this our participant that you have in your lap? <laughs> yes, this is Charlotte. She is the, uh, the Omnipod Hi, user. She just came in from playing outside. Hi, Charlotte. Nice to meet you. Nice yeah. to meet you too. Hi. How do you like Omnipod 5? Oh what do you think? Gosh. If I had a wired pump, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> like the Omnipod was kind of rough at the start. It hurt a lot, mm -hmm. but that was just me kind of being me. But <laughs> now I love the Omnipod. Like the wired one would, would always get in the way like in everything yeah okay you can go play now <laughs> bye hi thank you bye charlotte we'll, um, we will all babysit okay <laughs> absolutely especially overnight actually omnipod omnipod five makes that great <laughs> um if we could this is happening in our chat 
the responses to this question, but for people that are watching on YouTube and that play this back eventually, if any of you can speak to on body geography when it comes to Bluetooth connection between the pod and the Dexcom, that would be great. So we've had no issues. She wears it and I mean, she normally has the Dex on the back of the arm and pod moves around to belly, leg, um, different places. And we haven't had any signal problems. However, she's pretty small. So I don't know if, how, what would happen in a, in a you know, taller person with more distance between them. I can jump in too, because that was one of the biggest challenges that we had at our site um, when the trial began was lost connectivity between the pod and the Dexcom. And line of sight is helpful. I think it's, it's not maybe as important now um, because it has significantly improved. There were various updates made to the pod throughout the trial, specifically to work on that problem of the connectivity. And I'll tell you, I've heard nothing about connectivity issues in probably the last year. Um, so I really feel good about that. I was really worried about it actually at first to be hundred percent honest with the experience that I was having with our patients. Um, but line of sight, I think does help is, is something to focus on, especially if you are having connectivity issues and line of sight just means because it's Bluetooth and, and this is true for any Bluetooth communication between the body, um, can cause problems with Bluetooth. And so that, you know, isn't immune from the Omnipod 5 because the Dexcom and the pod are communicating by Bluetooth. So line of sight would just mean that the Dexcom can see the pod without having to try and communicate through the body. So if somebody was struggling with connectivity, we would say, let's try and make sure the Dexcom and the pod are on the same side of the body and they're not going through. So we would say like, don't do butt and abdomen, for example, if you're having challenges. But the the, it's been so, so, so much improved that I'm, I'll be curious to see how much of an issue that really, um, that really is when it rolls out, you know, commercially. When Dr. Lai was with us, she made it a point of telling us how much engineering went into fixing that Bluetooth problem. Yes. So we really focused on that. Yeah, they did. They did an amazing job with that. Like they were super open to those issues and really committed to making it better. And it was, it's incredible. It was very noticeable how much improved it's been. Yeah. Um, can we have just a couple of food based stories since the main job of the person with diabetes or the person managing diabetes on O5 is food based bolusing? How is that like it happens on loop? I can speak from personal experience where I'm coasting into a meal with like negative insulin on board, you know? Um, and I have to override because I know that thing is going to, that meal is going to shoot me up. So is there a way of successfully overriding with the bolus calculator, deciding to cut off basil? Um, or how is it that you guys who have been using the system go about that? Because it seems like that can be very common on AID systems that you're coasting into a meal with almost no insulin on board. I mean, if someone can tell me if they have it figured out, I mean, for <laughs> us, it wasn't perfect. Um, and like I said, my daughter would not bolus like 15 minutes before she would be like, I'm eating this right now. And we don't limit carbs in our house. So, you know, it's like an English muffin or a bagel something. So what I noticed is that she still spikes, but it's not like a two arrows up like emergency. It's just a, okay, she's rising from the food that she's eating. And then you see it come back down. If she were to have something like boba tea, which she loves, full of sugar, there's so much sugar, even if you get 25% sugar in those things. So you can tell the system that you want to give more insulin than it's telling you. You can adjust it just like you would on the Omnipod before. Um, so we just know, like we call them pretend bol fake boluses and like give yourself just little tiny, sometimes we just do like 0 0.4, 0 0.3. I don't know if that's what you're supposed to do, but that's kind of what we did with looping. And it seems to, it always will come back into range. Um, so I don't know how impatient other people are. Yes, there's times where I'm like, oh, I wish your blood sugar was not like this, but I feel like it's doing the best that it can with 
a 15 year old's lifestyle, <laughs> if that makes sense. Veronica, Charlotte, do you guys have any experiences with this? Some tips for us? I feel like we did, we do exactly the same. We kind of get these little, you know, micro boluses again, just, you know, maybe um, a quarter of a unit, something like that going up for a while. That's what we do with pizza. We have lots and lots of intervention until we feel <laughs> for fairly certain that we're not going to get a spike and then we might. Um, but I, I do feel, um, <sighs> I mean, I think we're doing that thing that Lube would do, you know, to kind of, we're trying to mimic the absorption rate of a food by doing the interventions ourselves. Um, the study people ha here have told us that if we backed off and let the system take care of it, it would do it just as well as we're doing it. Again, I've always been a little bit of a control freak and I'm like, oh, I, I don't know, I don't know. And I don't know if, um, if Rebecca was part of this part of the trial where they had to do the exercise challenge where, you know, we went on, we had to do three hours of exercise and then give like a 60 carb meal, which she never even really has normally because she's so small and see about the system bringing us down. Um, that for us was a disaster and we had to intervene. Um, so I think we do exactly what they do. We kind of cheat. And if we see that she's going into a meal with very low IOB, unless she's at school where we don't want um, to, you know, we feel it's safer just to keep whatever the system is doing, we will override that at home. And we typically do get a little bit of better outcomes when we're thinking about things like this. But again, I rather have that, you know, little bit of a spike um, and a little bit of A1C for her to be able to take care of herself more independently and be able to enjoy that independence at, the, at this age. The kid who was diagnosed at two, let me tell you, you're thinking the right way um, because <laughs> imbibing the independence really early is extremely important as she becomes a teenager. Um, what kind of settings adjustments did you guys do, right? There's only a handful of things that are actually in your control, it seems like with O5. And what was, what did you find that was well applicable to like bringing those blood sugars down into range? Are you adjusting correction range? Are you adjusting carbs? What's going on there? I feel like we have really aggressive insulin to carb ratios. Mm. And I think kind of trying to um, mimic that super bolus. Yeah, head off those spikes. Mm -hmm. You can change the insulin correction factor, right? Yeah, you can change any of the bolus calculator settings and then you can adjust the target glucose too. Mm -hmm. You can have different targets for different times of day. Um, these correction factors and carb ratios, well, does the correction factor affect how the system performs outside of a meal or is it only used for meal calculations? The correction factor is used for calculating user given correction boluses. So if your glucose was high and you went to the bolus calculator, you could give your own correction bolus. Um, but it doesn't seem to change how the system performs without intervention. It would not impact the automated insulin delivery. The automated insulin delivery is based on the TDI and the adaptive basal rate that it determines. And then it adjusts from that adaptive basal rate based on the current and projected glucose value. So yes, the only thing that directly influences the automated insulin delivery or the adaptive basal as they're calling it is the target glucose. That has a direct impact because the algorithm directly uses that in its calculation. In the confines of the trial, because you know, O5 approves with a one hour outlook on projected yeah. glucose. Mm -hmm. Within the confines of the trial, did you try that at different ranges? The projection mm -hmm. that the algorithm was using? Yeah. You know, that is a really good question and they probably did, but I don't actually know that. In the various iterations of the algorithm testing that we did over the multiple years, I would bet that they did. Probably. Um, but I actually don't know. That's a great question. Okay, Kenny or Tina, you got anything? Uh, how was, I guess either one of you can answer, but how was pizza on, on <laughs> compared to what you experienced either with loop or PDM usage before that? It beats MDI. <laughs> um, I don't think it beats, I don't think it beats loop. Yeah, I'll agree with that. 
I don't think it beats Luke, but I think it does a great job. I mean, it does the best, but it does what it can. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're, you're getting a spike, at least for us, we're getting a spike into the 200s. We're not getting a spike into the 400s. Same or thing. Or a us. horrible low. Yeah. Either. Same thing with us. That's amazing. So here's, I see a question here, um, very interesting. What surprised you the most about Omnipod 5? Any of you? How user-friendly it is. Really? really just, it's, that's one thing that they've nailed is the, the I think the user interface. I think they've nailed that. It's just so easy, so intuitive that, I mean, since Charlotte was six, she's been able to, um, you know, to, to really care for herself. What, what was the training like? <laughs> what was the training like? You are adorable, by the way, Charlotte. <laughs> Thank um, you. What was the training? What were you given to learn this? Me? Well, we were given... Um, I guess that the, the researchers at Stanford sat with us and, you know, we went through the different things. And I think for a week, we had a lot of like hands-on and phone calls and check-ins, but again, not, not that much. One, maybe because we were loop users. So we already kind of were into, um, used to these automated systems, uh, but not a lot of, on how to use a system because it's very intuitive. Yeah, I mean, I can say from a training perspective as the one doing the trainings, it was, and I've trained on lots and lots of different types of pumps, investigational and commercially available. And this is one of the easiest ones I think I've ever trained anyone on. Even people who have never used a pump before, I would agree with um, Veronica, I think it's Veronica, um, that it's very user-friendly and intuitive. A lot of other pumps you realize I kind of realized how not intuitive a lot of other pumps are be, when I was training this one because of how quickly and easily people picked it up, even with coming from MDI and not really even having a lot of exposure. So it's pretty easy. It actually seems like 05 might be easier to learn than just using the Omnipod itself. I Is think that... so. Like, I think it's easier than Is Dash that... and, and <laughs> and a lot better than the original Omnipod as far as the user interface. Um, in, yeah, my, in my perception of training, it's much easier to, to learn than both of those, I think. So yeah. Carrie, if you, could, if, if you could wave your magic wand, would you put a brand new person on Omnipod 5 as soon as you could? Like someone who is brand newly brand diagnosed? Brand new diagnosed, yeah. I would, yeah, I absolutely would. Because of how easy it is to use, and how kind of simple it is. Um, I think, and again, my, my perspective is always around pediatrics. So to keep that in mind, but when I, when I think about, I mean, one of the biggest challenges that kid, parents of kids with type one have is school and to have a system like Omnipod five in the, um, in the infusion set, like the auto insertion is really life-changing for a lot of, a lot of kids um, to just be able to push a button and, put a sticker on your arm and push a button to insert the cannula. I mean, it just, it doesn't get any easier than that. Um, and so it just makes it very accessible, I think, and promotes just an overall healthy, a healthy, normal childhood with access to all the things that everyone else has. So I would, I think I would put someone on it right away. I have a question for Rebecca. Um, how do you think, I mean, I know it's a, it's naturally a challenge, but how do you think Omnipod 5 did handling monthly changes for your daughter? Until it needs kind of shifting, you know, two, three times a month. Um, so I say, I, w I think it's a challenge across the board. It's not perfect. It's something that I would see her insulin needs increasing. And I would reach out and say, hey, can you guys take a look at her blood sugars because she's running higher they would make a change. And even though that change was just meant to be for like during the week of her period, it kind of just seemed to work itself out. I never had to readjust those settings back to what they were. Um, but I would say for her, she doesn't really have a huge disruption in blood sugars. I don't know how it is with other people, but for the most part, yes, we do see some increase in, in um, insulin needs during that time, but it's nothing 
that we haven't been able to handle so far. Um, so I think the system has done a great job with handling uh, insulin needs. Increasing. Okay. So uh, I'll give a little context uh, for things like sickness or insulin need changes when I'm helping other people. I can usually like spot it, you know, that first night, first morning and make adjustments in loop with an override and we're usually good to go. So my, one of my concerns would be, and I've seen sickness um, have a steady increase in insulin needs over, you know, a day, every day or two, it goes up and up and up and up. And then it usually drops off faster as you're getting better than it took to get up that high uh, in terms of more insulin needed. And so did anyone, and because Omnipod 5 takes three days to like figure it out, <laughs> uh, I want to know if you guys had to deal with, or Carrie, if you saw other people having to deal with like sickness, for example, where insulin needs went up and then went back down. Well, what's, what's kind of the best practice or what did you end up doing as insulin needs went up and, and uh, maybe the Omnipod 5 didn't keep up, keep pace and then insulin needs dropped off. Did you see negative, like lots of lows following that? Anybody have any? And, yeah. and if you could throw in um, consideration for leaky pods and compression lows and even food holidays, there, there are questions about that too. They might kind of go to. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can start just by saying, definitely we had lots of illness throughout the trial. Um, we didn't see like post lows from that. Um, it, like I said, the, the, it's very good at preventing lows. And so we didn't really see that because the insulin needs increased then with the next pod, they were then running low the whole time. Um, for illness, there's a couple things. And I think this is true for all automated insulin delivery systems, the commercially available ones. Sometimes closed loop doesn't work very well when you're sick and you might actually better be better off going into manual mode where you have more control over the insulin delivery because I think of it as, whenever you're in a situation like an illness where your insulin needs have increased drastically, it's, it's, it can be sometimes hard for the algorithm to, to manage that because it doesn't know that. And um, so the way that we approached illness was first, we just kind of saw how they were doing in automated mode with it. And if automated mode was handling their blood sugars fine, then they would stay in. And if they weren't, then we would take them out and we would use temp basils and ramp it up to 200% temp basil and, uh, you know, and, and do all of that. Um, and that, you know, worked too. Cause again, these are just confined periods of time that you just try and get through. Um, at least in pediatrics, that's how, how it is. You just try and get through the illness as best you can. Um, and if automated mode is helping you get through it, then we keep them in. And if it's, and if it's not, then we take them out and then we put them back in when, when they're better. Um, yeah. So that, that's what, that's what I would say, but we definitely did not see like a problem with rebound lows after the other thing I think some people did, and this also came with some growth spurts that we saw in pediatrics that is just like an expected occurrence is we would suggest that they would, you know, give more correction boluses. Cause you can give a correction, you can give a bolus of any amount. The Omnipod five doesn't prevent you from overriding the bolus calculator. Um, and so to try and artificially up the TDI and, and get it to understand that you're needing more, we would just suggest like, if you're really concerned about this, like give more regular correction boluses, or we might decrease the correction factor if um, they were being kind of, if the, calculator was never recommending a correction, which was a common, you know, concern people had, or we would be like, you know, override it. I think the overriding thing is really, it's a balance because overriding the bolus calculator often does result in low blood sugars. Um, I saw it time and time and time again. Um, but I think it can still be done safely and effectively. I think it just takes like, if you look at the insulin on board and then you can make an educated decision about how much you're giving based on that, where I think people got into more trouble with the roller coasters with overriding boluses was, was solely thinking about what they would have normally given on their standard therapy for the correction and not recognizing that, you know, your adaptive basal is probably four times the normal rate in the last hour. 
And all of that increased insulin goes into the insulin on board. So it provides you that information. It tells you how much insulin it thinks is on board. So if you use that information, then it can help you kind of have a more successful override that doesn't just cause a low. And so I think that's another, another thing to keep in mind um, when thinking about like these kind of more unusual confined situations where your insulin needs might be higher than, than normal. So I, I know you deal with pediatrics, um, but I'm going to ask you a question about a Fresa. Um, even in loop, if I run high, if I've had a failure, if I'm sick or whatever, um, I will use a Fresa. I will not put it in. It will, it's in and out so fast. Have you heard of any of the people on the adult, I guess on the trial, they couldn't, but have you heard any talk about how you would incorporate a Fresa for silly, stupid highs? I'm so sorry. I know nothing. I don't know anything about Fresa. <laughs> I don't think our, our clinic really uses a Fresa even in the pediatric population that's not in a clinical trial. Like yeah. We just don't have much experience with it. Do I know the adults adult use it. I think they do a little yeah. bit, but it's not approved yet for Pete. So yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's coming, but um, adults only can use it. Use it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not approved. All right. Great. Yeah. So Rebecca, Veronica, anything to add with sticky increases in blood sugar that you felt worked or didn't? I think I completely agree with what Carrie was saying that um, the, 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 I think the problems that we've run into with like kind of, you know, scarier lows or something like that really has been from over management of the system by overriding and thinking that we're smarter than the algorithm. Um, you know, I, again, what the, the, when we were doing the study here, they kept on, the researchers kept on telling us, just lay off it, let it do its thing. I don't think you're going to have better outcomes but like the, the need to control the, the tighter control, the whole thing. Um, so I don't know what, and we, you know, truthfully, we never really just said, okay, let it, let it be. Um, let's see what the system does. Cause we were always trying to be one step ahead of it. Um, but the, when we have gotten ourselves into a sticky situation, I think it really has been in retrospect um, and with a huge dose of, of humility to say it's been because we've been over, over correcting and over managing the system. So for us, the only situations that seem to happen um, with my daughter playing soccer, um, I don't know if anyone's touched on it, but uh, this system has hypo protect, which is really great. So if you know you're gonna do um, activity, I don't know what other people use it as, but she knows if she's playing soccer, hypo protect needs to be activated at least 30 minutes before she starts activity. And this changes your target glucose, I think to 150, if anyone can yeah. chime in. Yeah. And yeah. then it decreases your basal insulin by, I don't know how much. Um, so it's way cutting back her insulin. So yes, when she does, when she has high activity, this has happened since she was five years old, her blood sugar tanks. We can give her a snack. We can cut back insulin. We can give her protein. We can feed her Gatorade. It just activity makes her drop. Um, so we have seen hypoprotect time and time again, save her in that aspect. Does she still go low at during practice? Yes. Typically it's during the end. So after like three hours of strenuous running, playing, she will be at like 80, um, typically, but we have seen lows in the fifties. It, it happens, but typically it's because of an error that we've made or just really high levels of activity that the system can't keep up with. Um, when before this system, we were seeing multiple lows a day. We had lows at night. Um, kind of to circle back to the question that someone asked earlier, like what's the biggest surprise to you? Just the sleep, the uninterrupted sleep. When you put your kid in bed at night and you tuck them in, you know when you wake up at six or seven or eight in the next morning, their blood sugar is gonna be between 110 and 130. You're not waking up with a kid who's been 250 all night. I mean, we've been there so many times. She wakes up sick in the morning because Dexcom isn't working or the pump fell off or there's just so many different things that we used to deal with on a daily basis that I don't even think about anymore. Even and that to me is the biggest thing. <laughs> do you not get any compression lows on your Dexcom? No, we don't. And we used to see that before and I kind of touched on it. I don't know why it's still the Dexcom G6, but to me, for whatever reason, these sensors 
they're just more reliable. You just, we just have run into so few issues with these Dexcom sensors and with these pods. When before it was a constant thing that I felt like it was either the pod was leaking or the static would make the pod um, scream or the Dexcom was having to connect. Like it was just, there was always some issue. And with this system, since we've started, we have had very few issues and it's been wonderful. Yay. <laughs> it's someone, I love someone that. Asked, uh, someone asked in the chat, uh, do you see the, at least the, the systems calculated IOB if you switch over to manual mode and Veronica says yes. So if anyone wants to know the answer to that, there you go. Um, I have a question that we didn't get to ask Dr. Lai. Um, so what would you say from either experience or helping others uh, is a best practice for figuring out how to switch out to manual mode? Because one of my concerns is that you don't know what the algorithm is doing and how it functions at a low enough level to know what it thinks your basal rates are. And it's not externalizing that. So if you've been running closed loop for weeks or months or a year, and you need to flip out to a manual mode for whatever reason, how would you know what settings to use that would work when you go into manual mode? Does anyone have any ideas around that? I have some thoughts on that. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, what I would probably do is look at, because you will be able to see what the total like average basal you've been getting by the algorithm is. And so you can use that to kind of estimate what basal rate it thinks. You would know what it thinks is basal versus IOB. It tells you that in the reports. It, no, I mean, it will tell you that your, you know, your total basal delivery algorithm, insulin delivery, if you will, is, you know, a certain amount. And then your bolus insulin delivery that you give is another amount. And that's a way you can estimate what, what basal hmm. baseline basal rate, basically that, that you might want to start at. Um, it's not a perfect science because you're right. Some of that basal is due to because it's automated is due to like, you know, adjusting for increases in your, in your blood sugar or decreases and things like that. But it's a baseline place. It's a baseline place to start from. And what, what about reports? Um, what, what does this feed into? Is, is it their, their own system? Gluco. Right now it's Gluco. Yeah. Are there any options? Could you go to Tide Pool? Could you go to Night Scout? That may be coming later at at this point, I know that in the, at least in the limited market release, because all of our study participants are moving into that, it's going into Gluco by the cloud and it's uploading automatically every hour. Um, and, even, and even the controller has a SIM card in it provided by Insulet with cellular connection. And so even if you're using the controller and you don't have Wi-Fi, it still will auto upload to the cloud every hour which is like my favorite thing in the world because it makes it so easy to access, access the data. Um, but I don't know if there's plans to allow it to go to tide pool, but right now I know it's Gluco. They have a HomniPod view, right? App uh, probably be supported at some point. Yeah, I'm told at some point. It's not currently supported, but. Can bring me the packet. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I just asked about this that, it's not currently supported with Omnipod 5, but they're, they do plan to have it be available at some point. I, I'm gonna, I, I'm being very aware that you guys, a lot of you folks are on the East Coast um, and it is bedtime. I see jammies and a, a reading book for Charlotte. Um, I, I, I am going to um, get this video out and be on the YouTube channel and um, also include the list of questions and I'll provide that to you, Carrie, as well. And over to Trang Lai if she wants to see what was asked on this, this Zoom. Um, I just want to thank you for giving us your time. Uh, the comments going back and forth between admins are, th this has been remarkable, that you're, you're answering the questions we've been asking each other like we have answers. Um, but you guys do have the answers and it's been wonderful. Thank you very, very much. If we have more questions, may we follow up? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Sure. Well, good. I have your email. So I can... yeah. yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, that is fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a really nice rest of your evening. Um, everyone who joined in, um, Charlotte will read your bedtime stories anytime. Uh, <laughs> sweet dreams, sweetie. And thank you everybody for joining in tonight. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night.